Hello and welcome to the National Leadership Briefing. My name is Doug Sharp and I will be your host today for the briefing. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an awful lot to cover today, so we're going to get right into it. First of all, exciting day ahead for us. We have something that's happening that we have been looking forward to for a long time. We have a project called conservativeupdate.com. It's a website that we put in place so that you could have your voice heard within the leadership election process of the Conservative Party of Canada. Now, we put the website up as a place to house something called Operation Engage. Operation Engage, if you'll recall, was set up because what we wanted to do was make sure that as the leadership election process began, that the things that were important to you, the four pillars, which we'll talk about in a second, the things that were important to you were considered in the mix of the things that were discussed during the leadership election process. So Operation Engage within the conservativeupdate.com website was set up to do just that. Now, this is what has been happening so far. First of all, if you'll recall, we invited members of the faith communities from all across the country to join us, to join Operation Engage, to come and register on conservativeupdate.com, to have a look at the legislative and policy proposals there, and to express their support for the four pillars, which of course are that parents have the right to raise their children the way they want, that those we elect to serve us in civil government respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion, that the laws and policies of civil government must provide for the safety and security of the citizens, and of course, that the vulnerable are protected, and finally, that our children are not continuously having debt heaped upon their back, turning them into bond servants of civil government. So we rally around those ideas and we invited the leadership election candidates to to come and have a look at the website, to consider the things that were important to you and to give them an opportunity to respond to you and share with you what their views were so that you could decide which leadership election candidate best represents your views and values. Well, here we are on June the 5th, the day we've been talking about, where the leadership election candidates are now able to respond to you, and that's what we're bringing you today. We are launching the videos on what's called the candidate communication page of the conservativeupdate.com website. If you go to conservativeupdate.com, effective immediately today, you will see that on the candidate communication page, you will see videos from all of the candidates on each of the four pillars. That's each of the four things that I just mentioned. And they are, they've had an opportunity to go to the website. I've invited them to take a look at the legislative and policy proposals that are there and say whatever they want to say to you about the website itself and about the, in, the issues that are listed there. Now, here is the situation. This is where we're at in the process. The membership cutoff phase of the process is over. So there is only a specific group group of people in Canada who are going to make the decision as to who will win this election of the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada and go on to most likely become the prime minister of our nation, occupying the highest office in the land. So there's only a certain group of people that are, that are now eligible to participate in this process. However, if you are arriving late to this conversation, I encourage you to pay close attention to what happens on the road ahead from this point on, because you are going to learn an awful lot about engagement. And this is why. When the leadership election candidates had their leadership election membership period cut off, and they knew they were only going to be talking to this finite number of people, in other words, there could be as few as 300,000 people that are going to be able to vote and eligible to vote, and the likelihood is that only about, about half of them are even going to cast their ballot. So it's going to be likely about a 150,000 people that could be selecting this all-important person for this all-important position. But even though you're not participating, even if you do not have a membership in that party and you were not able to participate, follow this along because you're going to learn what happens when leadership election candidates look at this pool, this finite number of citizens, and start negotiating for their support between each of the issues that are out there. For example, the one thing these leadership election candidates are not going to want to do is they're not going to want to alienate one area or one group of support or constituency of support 
by making commitments to another constituency out there. So they're going to be really careful about everything they say in this next little while. And you're going to be able to learn an awful lot about how they negotiate those positions, the support for those positions that we have listed on the, on the website and how it is that we earn their support and we continue to negotiate for them to support our positions right up to the day on August 21st when they select the person who is going to be the new leader of that party. So stay tuned, even if you're not a member of the party and even if you're not participating, you are gonna learn a lot. Now, here we are, I'm gonna start today, I'm just gonna show you one video from each of the candidates so you get a bit of a flavor as to exactly what it is that they've done for you, but I'm going to actually be focusing today's briefing on the third pillar. That's the pillar that says that the laws and policies of civil government must provide for the safety and security of the citizens, especially the vulnerable among us. Meaning that before any law or policy is passed in Canada, we would want our leaders to first check the box to ensure that that law and policy is safe for the most vulnerable that live among us in our communities. So I'm going to play for you one right after another, the four videos, one each from each of the candidates and what they had to say in response to the third pillar. Now, of course, we're going to be hearing more from them on the road ahead, but this is their video that they wanted me to share with you as part of their submission to conservativeupdate.com. So enjoy these four videos, just so you know, because we are right playing right even down the middle. We have, we're not going to tell you to vote for. We're not picking favorites here on the National Leadership Briefing. So we have actually taken the list of names and just drawn the names off and placed them in the order that the names came out. So there's no preferences to who's first or second. We're just going to play four videos in a row, one after another, and you're going to have an opportunity to hear what they have to say about the vulnerable people and their responsibility to provide for their safety and security. Okay, enjoy these videos and we'll come right back here to the desk and I'm going to tell you more about what we're going to be doing today as soon as we come back. Thanks so much. Enjoy. It has been said that a nation will be judged by how well it treats its most vulnerable citizens. Governments must provide for the safety and security of its citizens, especially the most vulnerable, including seniors, veterans, First Nations communities, refugees, as well as the poor and the disabled. I oppose the extension of euthanasia to the mentally ill who are in need of healing and hope. I also put forth concrete policies that will help protect vulnerable pregnant women and girls, including banning sex selective abortion and supporting pregnancy care centers. As Prime Minister, I intend to leave a legacy where I would be proud to be judged by how effective I was at protecting the most vulnerable in Canadian society. Canada is a safe and prosperous country, one that provides us with endless opportunities. However, there are still far too many Canadians that fall between the cracks or have been made vulnerable by poorly thought out legislation or policy. I believe that the federal government's primary responsibility is to keep its citizens safe and secure. That applies especially to those among us who are most at risk. Sadly, the Trudeau Liberals have regularly failed their obligation to protect this group. For example, in his rush to legalize marijuana, Justin Trudeau failed to protect those who would be made vulnerable by this law. There was no plan to educate young Canadians about the potentially damaging and life-altering effect that marijuana usage could have on developing minds. No safeguards to ensure that those edibles wouldn't get into the hands of children. And a complete absence of equipment capability for detecting drug-impaired drivers. The police in this country were simply not given the time to prepare. And in his rush to expand the availability of euthanasia, Justin Trudeau failed to incorporate safeguards to ensure that informed consent of the most vulnerable could be assured. Further, the government failed to ensure that palliative care options were made readily available to those considering medically assisted dying. Another at-risk group among us is those who are victims of Canada's opiate crisis. Throwing more money at the problem will not make it go away. And any proposal to end this crisis must have as its primary and ultimate goal 
the rehabilitation of the user, and their reintegration into their community. As Prime Minister, I will work with the provinces and territories to develop a plan that will give real hope to this vulnerable group. Lastly, I want to applaud the efforts being made to protect young children against the effects of pornography and online abuse. And I will support these efforts in any way that I can to help prevent adults who are in trust relationships with children from exposing children to sexually graphic materials and pornography. As Minister of Justice in the Stephen Harper government, I introduced the Victims' Bill of Rights, which placed victims, including children, and those who have fallen prey to human traffickers at the very center of our justice system. We also brought in legislation to help block and stop the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. I believe that addressing the needs of the most defenseless among us will require a collective effort involving all levels of government and civil society and an engaged population. To the greatest extent possible as Prime Minister, I will encourage and incent community partnerships that will allow us to maximize the resources available to support vulnerable groups. We are a caring and compassionate people. I know that. And we all know that working together will significantly improve the living conditions and the life outcomes of those less fortunate among us. A government can best be judged by how well it protects the health and safety of the most vulnerable members of society. There are several things I would do to improve life for the most vulnerable Canadians. I am unapologetically pro-life and I will encourage parliamentary debates and votes on abortion and abortion related issues because it's long past time the rights of the unborn were represented. I would also scrap all Canadian funding for abortions in foreign countries. I will raise the age nationwide to a mandatory minimum of 25 years for marijuana consumption since that is the age at which science shows the brain is fully de developed and less likely to be harmed by marijuana use. I will extend the official review of medical assistance in dying legislation to make sure we maintain the strongest possible safeguards for the most vulnerable among us. As Canadians, we pride ourselves on our commitment to helping others and protecting the most vulnerable in our society. It's what makes us Canadian. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've heard many uplifting stories about Canadians buying groceries for the elderly, donating PPE to hospitals, transforming their businesses to provide much needed medical support. But it didn't start with COVID-19. For nearly 10 years, our brave men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces defended the Afghan people from the brutal Taliban regime. Our soldiers oversaw the construction of schools so young girls could get an education. We helped build infrastructure for safe drinking water and protected religious institutions from the Taliban. During that same time, Conservatives were establishing the Office of Religious Freedom to better protect religious minorities around the world. We introduced mandatory minimum penalties for those who prey on young children through human trafficking rings. And we made it easier for organizations to sponsor refugees who were fleeing violence and persecution. But under Justin Trudeau, Canada is losing its way. He closed the Office of Religious Freedoms, ended mandatory minimum sentences for human trafficking, and even withdrew our soldiers from the fight against ISIS, the worst terror threat our world has ever seen, and he wouldn't stand up to fight it. Only Conservatives can be trusted to protect the most vulnerable of our society and stand up for those who are being persecuted. Together, we can take back Canada and once again make our country a shining beacon of hope for the world's most vulnerable. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the campaign team leads who were so willing to work with us at conservativeupdate.com and uh, for providing us those videos. Now, everyone remember this uh, website over my shoulder here, conservativeupdate.com. You are going to be able to not only go there now and go to the candidate communication page and see each of the videos from the candidates on each of the four pillars, but there's also an introduction video there. And there also is going to be a PDF, a downloadable PDF that you can download and share with the people that you've been serving. Cause remember,
remember what we've done here is we've set it up here so that all of this information that now that the candidates provide us you can fan out to, in your personal networks to your own sphere of influence and you can give them the information so they can actually make an informed choice as well on election day now we're going to be following along just 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 re remind you again don't worry about the ballots and when they come up and all that stuff and how you fill out the ballots and all that stuff. We're going to follow along this whole process with you. We're going to make sure that you have all of the answers. We're going to be touching base with you midweek on the midweek touch points. So you will get all of the information as you need it. But for now, I just want you to familiarize yourself with the videos and the candidates and their positions on the four pillars. Okay. Now let me just take a, let's take a look at what else we're going to cover here today. We're going to continue with the theme here today of the third pillar and focusing on the protection of the vulnerable and the need for the laws and policies that are passed by civil government to provide for that protection. So we're going to keep that theme throughout the whole day, but let's see what we're going to do next. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on acceptable loss theory. I want everyone to understand what that theory is and then we're going to roll right into an opportunity that we have before us to actually get ahead of the wave on something we know is coming at us that is going to possibly be a change to government policy related to human trafficking and prostitution. So we have brought on a, a person to the briefing today who is a human trafficking and prostitution educator, someone who raises awareness on, on the dangers of that, and also will help us understand where we're at and where we might be going if we don't pay attention to what decisions are being, being made by civil government. So you stick around for that. We're also going to be talking about, uh, uh, we're going to be heading over to the boardroom at that point, and then we're going to be launching something called the Faith, Family, and Freedom 500. I told you during a midweek touch point a couple of weeks ago that we, on the, on the National Leadership Briefing, of course, are building a national coalition, a national critical mass of people that support and believe and advance the four pillars. But there is an important advantage to you in your local communities to build local support in your personal networks. So the family or the Faith, Family, and Freedom 500 is a program that we're going to talk about that's going to help you and provide you the tools so that you can actually build your own networks and build support for the four pillars in your own community. And then we're going to finish up talking about the conversion therapy ban that just occurred in the city of Calgary. But we're going to be doing it from a little bit different perspective. I'm going to get, you're going to get a lot of information in the post notes today about the conversion therapy ban itself. But I want to look at one very specific aspect of the conversion therapy ban that I really think we need to acknowledge has occurred so that we can make a better or create a better response next time something like this comes at us. Okay, so we got lots to cover today. Let's get started. We're going to continue here at the desk before we head over to the boardroom. Let's first follow up on the, uh, the understanding something called the commitment statements that candidates are going to be making on the immediate road ahead. You've got these four candidates, conservativeupdate.com. We're going to shift gears in a minute, but I want to finish up on this with, the, with conservative update. What we are going to do is we're going to be receiving more and more information from the candidates in the days ahead. For those of you who have memberships in the party, as I say, you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to cast a ballot and choose in order which candidates you want to see win the election. So you're going to need to actually start negotiating with the candidates. Now, the way we do that is we ask them to make commitment statements to us related to the issues that are important to us. Now, if you go to the conservativeupdate.com website, again, right over my shoulder here, you're going to see legislative and policy proposals. You might want to pick one of those and you might want to say, look, on the conservativeupdate.com website, Mr. McKay, there is a, a policy proposal and a legislative uh, uh, proposal that talks about a national standard for informed consent for complex or dangerous medical procedures like euthanasia, abortion, gender surgeries, that sort of thing. All of these things that we believe that there should be some kind of uniformity between the different regions and provinces in Canada, ensuring that everyone gets the appropriate amount of information to make these very important decisions, these life-changing decisions. And we, need to, we believe that there should be a national standard for the content and quality of the information that people receive. So 
So what do you have to say about that? Now, this is where the candidates will each have an opportunity to make a commitment statement to you to in an attempt to earn your support on election day. So we want to be a, preparing ourselves to make to 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 encourage them to make their commitment statements as to uh, they might say well I will I am committed to definitely having a look at that and I'm definitely going to look at the uh, at working with the provinces and the medical provincial colleges to actually bring together a standard uh, we're going to look where it's deficient they might say anything but whatever they're committed to or willing to commit to you need to have very clearly defined in your head you need to hear from them on that but you've got to ask them to make the statement. They're not just gonna make it on their own all the time. Now, the advantage we have here is there's thousands of people already here in Canada that have come together in support of these ideas. So you are going to be alongside of an awful lot of other people saying that you want these ideas supported. So we are in that phase now, but you've got to participate. Send an email off. You're going to get the, the contact information for all the candidates. Ask them questions. Send them emails. Phone their offices. If you get a chance to meet them, ask them face-to-face. -face. Share their responses with your friends and family. Make sure that whatever they say to you, you get out to your people. But there's also another side of this, not just getting them to make commitment statements. You have to be ready to make yours as well. Because what happens is, is that it, it is on election time, we are exchanging commitment statements with the candidates. You're asking them to make a commitment statement about the things that they believe in. Well, you've got to be ready to make yours. So you've got to be able to look a candidate in the eye or put it down on paper and say, if you do this, then I am committed to voting for you, or I am committed to care, keeping you in the top two or of, of the choices that I have. Whatever your commitment statement is, and to whatever degree each of those things are important to you, you need to start making that decision in your own mind as to what you're willing to commit to say to commit to, to the candidates. Now, because again, they're listening. They're listening. They want to know, well, wait a second. If I negotiate support for this position, what am I going to get out of it? Because I might lose some support over on this side of the ledger. So I need to make sure that I'm not giving away too much to get that support. So again, we're in a negotiation. Just remember that a big part of it is exchanging commitment statements. Okay, great. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that then for now. And we're going to be talking now about, we're moving on now because I want to be, I'm going to be bringing on Kathy Peters, an educator in human trafficking and prostitution here in Canada. She is, she'll let her tell you all of her credentials, but I want, I want, before we bring her on, I want to talk to you about something called acceptable loss theory. And the reason why I want to talk to you about this is because I'm seeing more and more of it in Canada, in our Canadian government systems, we are seeing governments make or use this calculus more and more to enact very dangerous policies and pass very dangerous laws. So what acceptable loss theory is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you sort of a, 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 an example of it, is that in the, in the Second World War, during the time of war or any war, you've got these military leaders and they have objectives that they want to uh, achieve. They, they, they might want to take out specific targets, uh, use military strikes to take out say a, a munitions factory or they might want to actually take a specific area of land. Well, they've got to make a decision as to whether the cost of human lives, the, what they anticipate the cost of human lives is going to be, is worth achieving that military objective. So they, have, they, they say that they have acceptable losses. A number in there, they say, okay, this is an acceptable cost of human life to achieve that military objective. For example, if you're a, an, air, an airplane, a bomber, and you're flying over a munitions factory, and you've got an old folks home or a senior's home that's really close to the factory, and you know there's a risk that your bombs are going to actually land on the factory, you, make, you have to make a determination as to whether it is, it is a acceptable risk to human life before you drop those bombs. Now, thankfully, in our in civilized society here, they hold the, the value of human life in wartime is held very high for innocent civilians, and they really try to make 
targeted precision strikes on objectives like that. However, if there is a risk to human life, they have to account for it in their decision making. Now, what has that got to do with laws and policies of civil government? Well, if you take a look at something like euthanasia legislation or marijuana legislation or our current lack of legislation when it comes to abortion procedures here in Canada, the government is actually, whole, they have in their hands a calculus that, 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 that says, okay, this is the cost of human life for us to proceed down this path, this legislative course, and they make a decision as to whether that risk to human life is acceptable, if they're acceptable losses, before they proceed. Well, the calculus here in Canada is something that is getting very, very dangerous and very, it's, it's quite unacceptable right now. And you're going to see that when we talk about, with Kathy Peters here, when we talk about human trafficking and the realm of prostitution law here in Canada. So I want you to keep that in mind. What is, we want to know as Christians and people of faith community in Canada, when we're watching politicians craft and draft legislation, we want to make sure that the laws and policies that they're passing are going to be safe for the vulnerable. And we also want to know what their calculus is and what they consider to be acceptable losses in human life if they pursued, proceed down this track. So keep that in the back of your mind. But uh, for now, I'm just going to be bringing out Kathy because, uh, because she is going to talk to us and share some information that's going to give us an opportunity now to get ahead of the curve on a decision that's about to be made by civil government here in Canada related to prostitution law. And, and she's going to explain the whole thing to us now, but let's just bring her out now. Well, Kathy Peters, thank you so much for joining us on the National Leadership Briefing. It's good to see you again. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate you take, taking the time today. Now, this is a very important opportunity that we have before us. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the third pillar, which is that the laws and policies of civil government must provide for the safety and security of the citizens, especially the vulnerable among us. And Kathy, you deal in an area which where there are many vulnerable people and there is a requirement for civil government to pay attention to the needs of this vulnerable, vulnerable group. And I'm referring to, of course, human trafficking and the issue of prostitution here in Canada. Now, for everyone who is not familiar with Kathy's work, we're going to do two things for you here. One is, is I am going to include a link uh, to a conversation that Kathy and I had on a previous national leadership briefing. So I, in the post briefing notes to this national leadership briefing, you're going to get notes at the end. You will see a link that will take you to a video of our first conversation. But then I'm also going to ask you, Kathy, if you would, to just remind us again of some of the work that you've been doing it, with regard to the education uh, uh, for na under people understanding human trafficking and the issue of prostitution in Canada. Could you do that for us first? Well, I want to be clear. First of all, I used to be an inner city high school teacher. So I've been working on this issue of sexual exploitation specifically for the last 40 years. So this has been a long time. It's been the last seven years specifically, I've been raising awareness to the issue of of sexual exploitation, specifically human trafficking for the purpose of prostitution. And I've been presenting tirelessly, full time, to the public, to the law enforcement, to the police, and to the politicians, all three levels of government. Specifically, ever since our federal law was changed and brought in in 2014, a new law called the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. That's the law that I want to see strengthened and enforced consistently across the entire country. At this point, it's spotty. It's not consistently enforced. So for example, Ontario is cited as best practices globally. Um, they are doing a fantastic job in raising awareness to the, this issue. Manitoba's doing a good job. Alberta's doing a good job. They actually have human trafficking coordinators in charge in the province that speak to this issue. BC is very, very behind. So I happen to be from BC, I taught school here, we've raised our family here. So I thought I would start to raise awareness and as I did it, I discovered 
people had no clue of this problem and issue in British Columbia. The rest of Canada, more so, but BC is a problem. Now, here's the key. The yep. sex industry, as a result, is very powerful here in BC and putting the pressure on Ottawa to fully decriminalize prostitution, to repeal the current law that we have. If that happened, that would open the floodgates to the sex industry. And um, that would be, it would change Canada very, very quickly. We would become the new bordello, literally, of the world. We have the longest border in the world with the United States. They would come up here for sex tourism. Right. So that's just a basic introduction to, to share my passion and my concern about what I'm doing and what I don't want and what I do want. I want right. the current law strengthened. Right. And Kathy, I, and as I've watched your work, you've really kept the focus on the, the reason why you do what you do at, at the core of it. I really do see your focus is on protecting vulnerable people. You really do care about people. And one of the things, obviously, on the National Leadership Briefing that we say a lot, it was remind, we remind people that the laws and policies of civil government have the ability to either harm or hurt the people that we're called to care about. So that's why we're engaged in this. I think that's also why you're engaged in it. Now, there's other countries in the world that have taken this step of fully decriminalizing prostitution. Some have even legalized it. What is the impact to vulnerable people when this happens in other countries or has happened in other countries? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, that's the problem. So the example would be the Netherlands that has fully decriminalized prostitution and Germany has legalized prostitution. New Zealand, the sex industry always used New Zealand as the excellent example of full decriminalization working but it's an island it's so remote it's out in the middle of the pacific ocean whereas canada if we again repealed this law that we have um with the united states with us sharing this long border with them it would be a disaster so in the netherlands and germany for example it's your it's your vulnerable that are always targeted aggressively it's your youth it's your children and in Germany, for example, they have fully legalized. That means they have government regulations. Um, it's not German women and girls that sell their bodies for sex. They have to recruit actively surrounding poor countries, whether it's in European countries or Africa or the Caribbean, because German women are typically educated and they don't want to be involved in the sex industry. So in Canada, translate that here, think, who is our most vulnerable? That is who the sex industry would aggressively target. It's our youth, it's our, our children, it's LGBTQ, it's gonna be our indigenous, it's gonna be the most vulnerable. They will be targeted aggressively and they are now, even with the law in place. That's why not only do we need the law strengthened, we need a robust national um, education awareness program. It's prevention education is what I do. Prevention education globally is lacking. Right. That is why I speak to this to prevent it. Well, and and, th and thank you for speaking to this issue because I, I just recently, um, uh, they, uh, I, I know that Joyce Smith spoke on a webinar with the Christian Embassy, and I believe I've got that correct, that that was the hosted by the Christian, uh, Christian Embassy in Ottawa. And, and tell me if, this, if these numbers, because I tell you, this is pretty, pretty surprising and shocking to hear but um, Joy had said that the average age of entry into prostitution here in Canada is 14 to 16 years of age. However, for Aboriginal girls, uh, they can be as young as seven to 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, is that accurate information? Absolutely, absolutely. And the problem right now with the COVID crisis, we've got children at home. They're not at school, they're not at community centers. So they're at home. So I've actually had phone calls from indigenous communities concerned about their children being targeted aggressively by the sex industry online. Most of the grooming and the luring for the sex industry now, it's 90% of it's online. And so this is Facebook, this is Instagram, TikTok, um, these different, oh, even uh, video games. Right. The, the traffickers will lure, become friends online um, make a relationship, and, and these youngsters will fall in love with somebody they haven't even met. The Indigenous, again, 
the, tra the traffickers are targeting extremely vulnerable indigenous. That's not uncommon. And so, right. yes, those ages are young. That is what they're doing. Okay, so so we have a we have a government right now, our current uh, federal government, um, that um, is is in in your as what you said is, is that you'd like to see these laws enforced and you'd you'd like to see the current laws uh making prostitution or the purchase of sex illegal right here in canada you'd like to see those laws enforced and beefed up and firmed up but what do you see happening instead in canada what is the move right now and what direction are we heading with this current government we have now well, my concern and the reason I'm, I'm doing this so full time is because the federal government is listening to the sex industry. And as I mentioned before, the sex industry in British Columbia is particularly powerful and strong and putting pressure on Ottawa. And Ottawa is listening. Now, again, um, I, I just really want to wake people up. You've got to be amazing to stop sexual exploitation. Yeah. It's, it's no family no community is immune to this and that's what um joy smith spoke to she added a couple of uh, other stats so i think that you should we should bring out 93 percent of this is domestic so it's local joy smith said within a kilometer of where you live there is somebody being targeted and being trafficked 50 percent are indigenous that are pulled into this just because they're vulnerable and there's a history of residential schools colonization they're they're in rural you know poor communities and the profit, the kind of money, see, it's lucrative. It's $280,000 per year per victim. That's how much money is at stake here. So there's a real incentive. And the target age groups are children. Very so young. if you talk to anybody that's been in prostitution, you ask them the question, when did they start? They started under age. That's where the money is. Yeah. So if you, if you um, fully decriminalize prostitution, which, which I mean, this, everybody says these are slippery slopes, you could ultimately end up legalizing it. So if you fully decriminalize prostitution, you therefore would increase the demand or open up the market to, for demand to grow. And then the supply would need to, there would be an uh, uh, added pressure on to create supply. And then that's when the aggressive uh, human trafficking of young people into prostitution would really start amping up. And that's a great concern. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. All fair to say. The only thing I want to clarify um, it's full decriminalization that the sex industry is going for. They're not right. talking legalization, okay. and there is a difference. Right. Germany has legalized, and there you have regulations. You have government regulations involved. Full decriminalization is Holland. They've backed off, and it just opens the floodgates. This is a point, point. But I do want to hold this up right at the beginning. Um, we do have a Canadian human trafficking hotline number. I ask everybody to memorize it. It's one 833 So anytime I present, I always talk about this National Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline that we have, which is fabulous. And it means anybody in any corner of Canada can get help. Fantastic. Uh, you know, Kathy, I, I'm, I'm, thank you again for what you do. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so important that we get that information that you share out to everyone. I'm going to make sure that we have links in the uh, post briefing notes to again not only the first conversation that you and i had but i want to make sure that we've got all the additional information that you want to share today but i i just in the meantime I just if there's anything we can do if there's anything you see popping up on the radar screen uh the, like bulletins but what can we immediately do i want to i want to give everyone a takeaway here today in in addition to what they're going to see after what can people do and plan to do right now to prepare for a potential move by government to fully decriminalize prostitution here in Canada? Okay, I keep this really simple. You wanna learn about the issue, you wanna share, and you wanna alert. Hmm. So you wanna learn about it. I mean, there's lots of websites, Joy Smith Foundation website, go to her website, learn about the issue, share it with your family and friends and your contacts. And then number three is alert. When I say alert, it means your politicians. Start with your member of parliament, but also your provincial leaders and your mayor and city councillors. For example, this coming week, I'm presenting to yet another city council because they, they know what's going on in their communities. That's really important. Again, what I, here's my bumper sticker. Be amazing and stop yes. sexual exploitation. I even have bumper stickers now. And yeah. the RCMP, I mean, 
collaborate with your RCMP, your local law enforcement, let them know that you're concerned about this issue. And they are running an I'm not for sale campaign. Support your local law enforcement. Fantastic. Well, we're going to be talking about about um, a ways that uh, that uh, ministerials and churches can engage municipal governments right after this. So I'll make sure that we talk about that and include this as a piece of information. So all of the links that you mentioned, we're going to make sure are included in the post briefing notes day. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us. And thank you again for all the work you do. And please keep us informed as to what you see and what you think we need to know on the road ahead. I certainly will do that. Thank you very much for the privilege, Doug. I appreciate it. God bless. God bless, God bless you. Bye-bye now. Well, don't forget to check the post-briefing notes for that valuable information that you can begin to review, preparing yourself locally to be a responding and addressing the challenges we're going to have on the road ahead as governments attempt to change the uh, legislative uh, framework of the prostitution laws here in Canada. Okay, great. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to roll over to the boardroom and we're going to cover two final things there. We're going to finish up in the boardroom today. First, we're going to be talking about the Faith, Family and Freedom 500 program. And then I am going to be touching on the conversion therapy ban issue from a little bit different perspective. So stay tuned and we'll wrap up in the boardroom. Bye for now. Okay, it's good to be back in the boardroom with you. As you know, I love it here. It's a great spot for us to spend time. We've got to train. We've got to drill. We've got to stay sharp. That's the, what we've got to do on in this environment especially. There's a lot coming at us right now. So let's make sure we take this valuable time to actually keep up in our game all the time, making sure we're practicing, drilling, training, and getting better. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. As I mentioned before, we are going to be looking at something, a new program called the Faith, Family, and Freedom 500. Now, it's not so different really when you look at the foundations of what I am about to propose to you. On the National Leadership Briefing, we're always talking about how strong we can be if we all come together and speak with a unified voice on a national scale. If we're talking to speaking to national issues, national governments, and there are a lot of us, we can definitely have a voice, but we've got to come together. And what do we come together around? Of course, the four pillars. We talk about that a lot. However, there is a lot that you can do locally to train yourself to be looking for those opportunities to advance the protection for the vulnerable, the respect for religious freedom, parental authority being advanced as a primary component of raising kids, and also, of course, local debt. Local governments take on an awful lot of debt. And so we want to have our voices represented, not just on the national level, but in our local community. So we're going to use this Faith, Family, and Freedom 500 strategy to raise the level of, of understanding and the profile of the four pillars locally. Let me show you how it works. Okay, first of all, we're going to be looking for individuals in local churches. We want to springboard off of infrastructure that we already have. Now, I'm not talking about taking the local church and turning it into a political tool. I'm just suggesting to you that where people of like mind and, and, and views can 
come together right now is in the local church. In your local church, you're going to find an awful lot of people that want to raise their kids in the way that their parents raise them. You're going to find a lot of people in your local church that really do want elected representatives to respect and defend their right of belief and freedom of religion. So you're going to save yourself an awful lot of time if you just hunt where the ducks are. That's what they say is fish where the fish are and hunt where the ducks are. Well, in your local church, you're going to find an awful lot of people that share your views and values. So that's why I say start here. And what you want to do is you want to, in your local church, you want to look for 50 people that actually share your views and values that are willing to work with you in support of and in advancing the four pillars. So if you are in a local church of less than 50 people, then you're, you, you, you're sort of looking for people that are, that are in that mix that are willing to work with you. Now, in a church of less than 50 people, which is kind of, as I understand, there's an awful lot of churches of 80 and less members all across Canada. So let's take a, let's use that as the example, is you've got less than 50 people in a church. You might only find maybe eight to 10 people who are willing to work with you. Now, there's lots of people in the church that are willing to pray with you and pray for you and are willing to pat you on the back and say, go get them, Tex. But we're, we're talking about eight to 10 people who are willing to actually work to advance the four pillars. So in a church of less than 50 people, you're looking for eight to 10 people that are willing to work with you. And then what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the infrastructure of something we've already taught and trained on, which is the Civic Affairs Committee. If you saw, so I'll just cover that real quick here, is in local churches, we have encouraged pastors and leaders to allow citizens within the church to come together in support of the pastor to bring issues to the pastor's attention, local issues that are important for the church to be made aware of. And then the pastor on Sunday can decide what's relevant, what needs to be spoken of from the platform, and what it is that is appropriate to be spoken from the platform. And then they, the pastor will share that information. So the civic affairs committees should be in place already. If you don't have one in your church, we've got a civic affairs committee Canada website that one of the people that came on the briefing one time started. So I'm going to include that link in the post briefing notes so you guys can actually get your civic affairs committees started. But you're looking for eight to 10 people in your church that are willing to utilize the infrastructure of the civic affairs committee and build an email based communications network. So we're not talking about social media platforms. We're not talking about, you know, smoke signals on the horizon. We're talking about email based 50 people that in the church eight to ten of them work to build a network an email based network of totaling 500 activated citizens that means that you're going to have to go outside of the walls of your church to build that 500 person network so now where do they come from? Well, again, if you've got eight to 10 people and they're using the Civic Affairs Committee infrastructure, which means that they're working together as a team and strategizing, okay, how can we grow the locally, the awareness of the four pillars and how can we attract people to supporting these principles and who are willing to work with us in advancing these ideas locally. Well, that is something that the civic affairs committees can work on together, but there's lots of ideas that we're going to be offering you right here on the national leadership briefing. And that's why I say at the very end here, supported by the NLB. So all of your efforts are going to be supported by what we're teaching and training on the NLB in helping you to build your local networks. So now let's start to start, go back to the beginning. Remember, is we're all getting together nationally, all across the nation to build the awareness nationally. But national, our national strategy is built on every individual person building their own personal networks. And now we're talking about building a community network a network of people that are willing to advance the four pillars. So this is what the faith, freedom, and family, the faith, family, and freedom 500 is all about, is a church of less than 50 people out of that group, finding 500 people in a community that's willing to work together to advance the four pillars. And what we're going to be doing is also teaching you to look for opportunities and how to identify them locally where you can have influence 
locally and how you can identify and capitalize on those opportunities like school board trustee elections. What can 500 people network together on an email-based platform accomplish during a school board trustee election that's happening in their local region? Well, an awful lot, especially if down the road, there's another church with another civic affairs committee that's also got 50 people. There were out of, out of that 50 came 10 that built their own 500 person network. And now you got two 500 person strong networks working together to advance the four pillars into a school board trustee electoral process. So you can kind of see how you kind of, you take, you take one here, one here, one here, and then we're going to join the dots regionally, and then we're then provincially, and then nationally across the country. So that is what the Faith, Family, and Freedom 500 is all about. Now let me show you where it gets really exciting. Check this out. We're talking about a church network, a church starting at 50 members. What, there, there are some churches out there that have 500 members. Well, if you've got a church of less than 500 members, you can take that and call it the Faith, Family, and Freedom 5,000. Because if you can do it with, start with 50 people and build an email-based network of 500, you can definitely start with 500 and build one of 5,000. Now you're talking influence in a, very, in a regional level. You're obviously going to be in a bigger market, but you're going to have a lot more influence. Okay, great. So I'm going to leave that with you because I want you to let that gel and think about it, especially if you got civic affairs committee organizers out there right now that are supporting your pastors. If your pastor's not on this briefing today, take this idea to your pastor and go, can we actually build a 500 person email based network of people that would, have, that, would, that would scan the horizons and work with the national leadership briefing nationally and actually advance the four pillars locally? Could we accomplish that? And then talk with your pastor and work that out with them because we want to work with you and support you locally as well. Okay, we're going to close on this. I told you we were going to close talking about the conversion therapy ban issue and the meetings that just took place in Calgary. Now, I'm going to leave with you a video. I'm not going to play it today. I'm going to leave it in the post-briefing notes, which is going to be an excellent summary of what actually transpired in Calgary. Every person on the briefing, every citizen, if you live in a municipality anywhere in the country and you're a person of faith, you need to know what happened in Calgary. And we're gonna provide you the very best video below, in, or sorry, I guess it'll be in the post briefing notes, where you can actually see the summary of what happened. We're also going to provide you with rock solid information from various sources like the EFC and the Canadian Council of Christian Charities and ARPA Canada did a fantastic one as well. And I'm going to provide the links below on the issue itself of conversion therapy. Okay. And the bans that are happening both municipally and the proposed legislation right now federally. But what I wanted to talk with you today about was what actually happened in Calgary and has been happening in municipalities all the way along this road as these mini fires have started to break out across the city. What we have discovered is, is that local leaders in the churches all of a sudden find themselves being confronted with an issue that needs to be dealt with through their municipal government leaders. And in Calgary, they were very fortunate because there were some pastors that had good relationships with some of the municipal leaders in Calgary. However, for the most part, our faith leaders in our municipalities and in the cities across the nation do not have relationships at all with the municipal government leaders. So when all of a sudden there is a, pro or a municipal legislative or motion that's being proposed, all of a sudden all of the faith leaders are getting caught flat-footed going, I don't even know who to call. I don't know who these people are. So we have a situation. We have to, we have to acknowledge that if things like that start coming at us, municipally, locally, within our own communities, if we don't have relationships with our local municipal government officials, they are looking at these issues like conversion therapy bans, and they are making decisions not knowing who you are, where you come from, what you're all about, what your church is all about, and they are going to make these decisions, and it's going to, be, it's going to feel, feel cold 
and loveless. Believe me, that's what it was for the, a lot of people in Alberta that have been facing these, these bands and these meetings is you go in there and you've got no relationship. You've got no credibility with anybody. You're just going in cold and you're, you're on the defensive right away. So what I want to do is I want to invite every single leader, or if you serve a leader in the church here in Canada, I'm going to invite you to get in touch with me. My, my email address is president at familyaction.ca, president at familyaction.ca. And I'm going to invite you to get in touch with me because I want to share something with you called the City Action Council. I want to share with you a pro or propose to you something that you can launch in your city and that, that, that will be a much more effective than your traditional ministerial framework of how you interact with each other and how you interact with local government officials and business leaders in your community. And I want to provide you information that you can take and use to build an infrastructure locally in your municipality and in your ministerial and build with business leaders. I want to share a template with you that you can study and apply in your own community so that you have really strong relationships with your municipal government leaders. If things like this pop up in your community, you'll know each other that way. You'll be in relationship. You'll be working together and you'll be working together for kingdom purposes as well. So please, if you are perhaps a little frustrated with maybe your lack of action or activity with your local ministerial, or maybe you're just kind of concerned that maybe you might get flat, caught flat-footed and don't know any municipal government leaders, then we want to work with you and help you develop the City Action Council in your city and town and municipality. And we're so excited to do that because it is so important when things come at you that you are talking to somebody that knows you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. I just appreciate so much this opportunity to serve you once a month on the National Leadership Briefing, but also every week we touch it, we touch base on the midweek touch points. And I just love doing that too. So thanks so much. Get in touch with us if you have any questions. But in the meantime, God bless you. God bless your family. And may God continue to bless this great nation of Canada. Bye for now.